after hesitating for the benefit of people who do not understand French or not well enough, like even <coughs> Donald Linden Bell, I heard, um, I'm going to speak English. Sorry about that. Um, mais c'est tout de même... Micro, mais this is a microphone. Why is this microphone not working? Okay. The other one. Anyway, uh, the topic of the talk is a tribute to Michel Hénon's work. Uh, because this is, a, I mean, Michel Hénon has discovered beautiful examples of chaos in um, a gravitational field. And that's precisely, I'm going to give another example of a chaotic system in relativistic cosmology, which is a context of uh, cosmological billiards. So I will be self-contained and explain everything I'm going to talk about. So you have heard that um, at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, Alexander Friedman discovered the first exact non-stationary cosmological solution of Einstein's equations with matter, the expanding cosmological models or contracting cosmological models. The, the basic structure of these models is we have a, a space-time metric, okay, in a three plus one dimensional space-time. There is the, the time part. And then the space part in the Friedman model is very simple. This is a space of constant curvature, like the the three sphere, that is to say the three-dimensional analog of the usual two sphere, round two sphere. Uh, and, uh, but in front of it, there exists the so-called scale factor, which means that you have an expanding homogeneous and isotropic model. So this model is very simple. The, you have one dynamical degree of freedom. You have this scale factor, A as a function of time. And this scale factor satisfies the two equations written by Friedman. One of them is a second order equation, which says that essentially the, which says it can be understood in a Newtonian context. It says that the acceleration of the, because the scale factor is like the distance between two particles in this universe. So the gravitational force, the, the mass density is creating a force which tends when this sum is positive to uh, decelerate the expansion of the distance between two masses. And then you have another uh, consequence of Einstein equation, which is an equation which is like a constraint because it's not like it does not contain second uh, derivative in time, but only the, the square of first derivative in time uh, of this type, which says essentially in Newtonian language that the, the sum of the kinetic energy of the, the matter and something linked to curvature is linked to the, the density of matter. Okay, this is just a reminder of the Friedman context. In this context, one of the striking discoveries of Friedman is that if you put the simplest uh, matter content, that is to say you put a kind of fluid where the pressure is proportional to the energy density, which is this equation with a proportionality factor W, uh, then um, and no cosmological constants, then in general you find that the general solution will have a singularity. A singularity means here that the scale factor tends to zero somewhere, so it's saying the full space is crushed to a point. Okay, that's the so-called cosmological singularity. For instance, in, in a case which is quite a good description of the early universe, if there is a, a factor one-third between the pressure and the energy density, which means a relativistic gas, so if the universe is filled of photons, light, or very relativistic particles. In that case, you find that near the singularity, you have typical solutions which are power laws and which are like square root of t. Okay, the scale factor tends to zero like square root of t. And if you have a general equation of state with a w, you have a general power law of this type. So you have, this was the discovery of Friedman, uh, you can have uh, cosmological singularities where the whole space is crushed down to a point. So in, in visual language, you can say that the uh, Friedman solutions, they represent as a function of time, the evolution of a simple universe, which is like a round sphere, okay, a three-dimensional sphere, but it's still a round thing, homogeneous and isotropic, which starts from a point, a so-called Big Bang, 
which expands, 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 and maybe reconstructs or further expands. But clearly, the Friedman solutions, you, you find them because they are very simple. Uh, the structure of space is assumed to be just completely homogeneous and isotropic. And then, the, the, an important question was asked by Lev Landau at the end of the 50s, which is, is this singularity, the fact that space is crushed down to a point, Big Bang or Big Crunch, is this a consequence uh, of, uh, is it a general property of uh, Einstein's uh, theory of cosmology, or is it an artifact of the high degree of symmetry of the Friedman solution? Because in the Friedman solutions, the thing is so simple, you have just a one-dimensional ODE, and then immediately, qualitatively, you find there are solutions where the whole space is crushed to a point, but maybe this is due only to the full symmetry. And the first people to try to answer this solution were Isaac Halatnikov and Evgeny Lifshitz in 1963. And in their paper, they, uh, they introduce uh, an ansatz, they, they, and, and, and they try to prove the consistency of this ansatz. So first, they, they really try to, to solve a very difficult problem, which is what is the generic solution of Einstein's equation near a Big Bang singularity? Generic means the solution which contains the largest possible number of functions of four variables, okay? Uh, I mean, you give data which are a certain number of arbitrary functions in, in space at some moment of three variables, and then you try to find what is its time evolution near the singularity. So you really look for the generic or general solution near a singularity. And uh, although it looks like a daunting task, Actually, they uh, introduced uh, an answer, which is to say, they, they, they said that locally, probably, the singularity will be very anisotropic. And instead of seeing a space which is crushed to a point uniformly in all directions of space, they said probably at each point of space and at each moment, there are three directions, which are these vectors L, M, and N in space. And in this direction, the universe is, let's say, crushed in one direction and expanding in another direction and crushed in a third direction, like a rugby ball, if you want, something like that. And, but they looked, therefore, for uh, three functions here, three functions here, three functions here, and these three functions, A, B, C, which replace the single Friedman scale factor A by three different Friedman factors, A, B, C. And all those functions, they, they looked for functions of time and space, so a very fully generic solution, except they, they made the assumption that the time derivatives are more important than the space derivative, that near the singularity, the fact that it tends to zero means the time derivative is dominating. But uh, they did not succeed in finding a general solution of these equations. And then at the end, they said, OK, as we only find particular solutions, they concluded provisionally that the generic solution does not contain a singularity, OK? Uh, and uh, at the same time, in uh, Oxford and Cambridge, prompted uh, by this question of Landau and the work of Halatnikov and Lifshitz, uh, Stephen Hawking and Roger Penrose uh, uh, proved mathematical theorems, very important theorems, uh, which are expressed by saying that this prove, these theorems prove the genericity of a cosmological singularity. Except that I have put singularity here in, in quotes, because you see, the Friedman singularity, you know what you talk about, it's space crushed to a point. Uh, in the theorems of Hawking and Penrose, uh, you don't prove anything about the structure of a singularity. You prove that some geodesic is incomplete, that is to say that in the space-time, under certain assumptions, there is one possible observer, a geodesic, which does not continue for infinite time. But you never prove that there exists a singularity in the sense of infinite curvature or whatever. And so they are important, but they don't tell you much about the structure of the singularity. A renewed effort was made a few years later when Halatnikov and, and Lifshitz enlisted the help of a, a young physicist, Volodya Belinsky, and uh, this uh, trio of scientists, they succeeded in, in finding the general, generic solution of Einstein's equations, so modulo some physicists' assumptions. I mean, they make an ansatz that something is small compared to something, and then they construct a solution which satisfies this, and then they hope that that will be the generic solution. Uh, 
And they did find that in the limit where the volume of space tends to zero, that is to say, there are those three scale factors. So their, uh, their type of solution is of this type, which was introduced by Halatnikov and Lifshitz. So instead of having a, a kind of, of round isotropic contraction of the universe, at each point of space, it is anisotropic. And also, it depends on the point of space where you are. But they could write, uh, they, 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 they got uh, the fact that the three scale factors ABC, the local scale factors, they do satisfy a complicated dynamics, a coupled inhomogeneous dynamics. And their important discovery, which is the topic of this talk, is that uh, this, top, this dynamics is chaotic. Okay? So at the end, you have these three quantities which uh, depend on space, but at each point of space, they essentially depend only on time. And therefore, you have like a particle in a three-dimensional space, you know, three quantities ABC coupled. And this dynamical system is chaotic. And that's what I'm going to talk about uh, before uh, introducing technical details. So the, the idea is either, and by the way, this solution is valid either near a Big Bang or a Big Crunch, because in Einstein equations, time arrow does not exist. So if you are, uh, it's just a question of definition. So if you are near a big crunch, which means you have a future singularity instead of a past singularity, uh, the pictorial vision is that space here is something which at each point of space has those direction of expansion and contraction. And these directions, they change as you go. Uh, the direction of space, let's say the east-west direction, now uh, becomes, which was contracting, becomes expanding, and then uh, the north-south, uh, which was uh, contracting, becomes expanding. And, and you have an infinite number of uh, change uh, like that. And at each point of space, also, this thing vary from a point of space to another point of space. So this is this type of chaos that I'm going to talk about. Now, one way to see better this chaotic dynamics is to uh, introduce the representation by billiards. Okay, so what does it mean? Instead of working directly with the scale factors ABC of the three direction of space, you introduce the co-logarithms, that is to say the negative of the logarithm of ABC. So you write ABC as exponential minus beta 1, exponential beta 2, exponential beta 3. You put a minus sign because you are interested in uh, contracting towards zero volume. And therefore, it corresponds here to the beta 1, beta 2, beta 3 going to plus infinity, essentially. It's just more convenient to have something going to plus infinity than minus in infinity. And when you look at what Einstein equations tell you about the dynamics of these three variables, uh, you find that uh, uh, although there is a special dependence, because you never assume the thing is uh, homogeneous, I mean, things depend on space, but at each point of space, essentially, you have a dynamics for the three variable, variables beta, which is given by uh, a kinetic term and a potential term. The kinetic term is a quadratic form, but this quadratic form it looks first like the initial kinetic term for a particle, with three variables, beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, the sum of the velocity is square, except there is an extra term, which is minus the square of the sum. This means that this quadratic form is not a positive definite kinetic term. It is a Lorentzian uh, signature uh, kinetic term. So there is one minus and three plus, if you make a Gauss decomposition. And, and then you have the potential. So what are the potential which makes this variable? If you did not have the potential, the solution would be a straight line in the space of beta, okay? which would correspond to the so-called Kasner solution, which means uh, a power law solution where A, B, C are t to some power. Okay? Uh, so it would be a power law contraction of the universe. But here, the fact that you have potentials here means uh, these solutions will not uh, persists uh, uh, near the singularity, but will become chaotic. The important information here, there is an inhomogeneous dependence in the coefficient. These coefficients are positive, generally, is that the potential are exponential type potentials, so-called Toda potential. But an exponential potential, as the beta become large, an exponential with large arguments, if, uh, if what is in the exponent here, which is this linear form of the beta, is positive, uh, it means it is nearly zero. If it is negative, it means it is nearly infinity. So it means these exponential things are like walls. So finally, 
the, the dynamics is like the dynamics, let's say, of a fly in, in a room like that. If you have a, a fly, it goes uh, straight, and then it bounces on a wall here, and then goes to another wall. So you have a billiard with walls. And so here is the uh, representation. So what determines the walls, for instance? It is the theory you look at. If you are talking about Einstein's theory in any dimension, the, the walls that will determine uh, what is the interesting aspects of this billiard is given by uh, this combination of the betas. Actually, if you are in three plus one dimensions and you compute this, you find that this wall means two beta one or two beta three or two beta two, okay? Just uh, a factor two, but in general, you have more complicated things. Now, the dynamics is the following. You have an auxiliary space, this beta space, which is a Lorentzian space. It's a space with a light cone. There is a minus, uh, uh, time, which means going up uh, uh, as a negative kinetic term, space, which means horizontal as positive, and then there exists a light cone where uh, beta dot square would be zero. And in this space, you have certain hyperplane, okay, which here are just planes, which are defined by the so-called dominant walls. Okay. In the case of interest of the original belinsky halatnikov lifshitz actually you have only these three Walls, the walls are the, uh, the planes here, okay, with, with a vertex here. And these three vertices, they are inside the light cone and they cut the light cone along this line. And, and now the motion of the universe, the universe here at each point, is characterized by the betas, which is the shape of the universe. It is a, a particle in this space which goes with the velocity of light, so it, it propagates parallelly to the sides of the light cone, but when it encounters a wall, this wall in reality would be an exponential function of beta. But quickly, when you have a particle going on this exponential, uh, either it is uh, above the wall and then the exponential wall is exponentially small, or the wall, it encounters the wall, and because it is exponentially large, you bounce like on a wall. So when you meet a, a wall, you, you go back, you bounce. So the particle goes like that. This is Yes, so now it is useful to introduce, to describe this chaos, this uh, representation. So first, there are two types of these Einstein billiards, and they can be chaotic or not, depending on some properties. But we'll see that chaos is dominating in this problem. Uh, if I have a, a billiard in Lorentzian space, which is defined by uh, like a, a simplex like that, I mean, a wedge between three walls, if all the walls are inside the light cone, the particle which goes with the velocity of light, the particle means the universe, okay? It means the dynamics of the shape and geometry of the universe. Uh, it goes straight, then it encounters a wall, it bounces, 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 and then you are trapped inside this thing. You go up because you, uh, you always go to the velocity of light, so you go up in beta space, which means the ABC, which is exponential of the beta, 10 to 0. So on average, the universe shrinks to smaller and smaller size, but in a complicated manner, because uh, it is anisotropic. Uh, but if the billiard were like that, if it protruded outside of the light cone, after a certain number of collisions, the particle would find an exit, which is going through this wedge here. And, and then it means the universe ends up in a monotonic time of power law collapse, instead of having a continued collapse. So a useful way to represent motion in hyperbolic space is to do this Beltrami projection. You know that instead of working in a Lorentzian space, a point in Lorentzian space beta, you can represent it uh, given this vertex by the magnitude of the distance to the origin, Lorentzian distance, and then by the direction. It's like when you have a point in three-dimensional space, you can represent it by the distance in polar coordinates, by the distance to the origin, and by the angle on the unit sphere. Here, the unit sphere, because I am in Lorentzian space, is a unit hyperboloid, because the, the set of points which have a square distance equal minus one here from the, from the origin is an hyperbola here. So these are polar coordinates, but in hyperbolic space. And this space, is no longer the unit sphere, it is a unit hyperbola, and this is Lobachevsky space. This is a constant curva negative curvature, infinite dimensional Lobachevsky space here. So you can represent the billiard by projecting it from the beta space onto the space of uh, direction from the origin, which is gamma here. 
gamma is on the unit hyperboloid. And then this billiard here becomes this billiard, and this billiard here becomes this billiard. And here you see better what happens. You have now a particle <laughs> moving on Lobachevsky space, which, goes, which follows geodesic motion, except when it meets a wall, in which case the particle bounces on the wall with uh, equal angle of incidence and reflection. And then you see clearly that probably this is chaotic, but this will not be chaotic because after a while you, you exit, but this is infinity, so you never come out of that. In the original BKL case, the, the dynamics was really, uh, for the ABC variable, was what is called an ideal triangle in Lobachevsky space, which means you take three points on, at infinity, you know Lobachevsky space, this is the disk model, the Beltrami or Poincaré disk, but this was introduced by Beltrami 20 years before uh, Poincaré in that case, uh, which is uh, the disk representation of the Lobachevsky space, and the uh, boundary of the disk is uh, the absolute of Lobachevsky, which means infinity. And so you take three points at infinity, you connect them by straight lines in the Lobachevsky sense, which means circles orthogonal to the boundary. And this gives you this triangle, okay? So this is the BKL original, I mean, Belinsky, Halatnikov, Lifshitz, Billiard. You can also represent it by the upper half plane model, which is usually called here, because we are at the Henri Poincaré, it's called the Poincaré plane, but it was also introduced by Beltrami and others before Poincaré. Uh, in fact, uh, Poincaré never claimed to have invented this thing. He just used them. He discovered that the automorphic function, the function functions were well represented in the Poincaré half plane. So the same model here is represented by this triangle with one point here at infinity, here at infinity, and infinity is also up there at infinity. Uh, and this representation is useful because the billiard now is you have these circles that bounce here and here and here, and each uh, each bouncing here between two bounces is represented by a half circle. And in order to parameterize the half circle, you pa can parameterize it by the initial point U minus on the negative, on the real axis here, and its final point U plus on the real axis. I mean, the circle is determined by the two points there. And therefore, each, uh, each uh, period, uh, so-called epoch of evolution of the universe, is characterized by this U minus and U plus. And then you can ask, uh, and then this gives rise to what, uh, uh, we call the Opscotch dynamics. So Opscotch was an English word that I did not know about. In French, this is called la marelle. So because you are going to, I will just show, I will come back to it. This is un jeu de marelle in the sense that this is the plane of U plus and U minus. And in this plane, one point corresponds to, you know, one of these trajectories here between two bounces. And then when you encounter a wall here, A, B, or C type wall, you bounce to a different point, U plus, U minus, in these planes, which means that, for instance, the initial point is here, then you, you jump to two, then you jump to three, then you jump to four, then you jump to five, and you have several regions which tell you whether you were bouncing between these two walls here or these two walls here on these two walls here. So it is a nice game. And this game, uh, now, mathematically, this game is interesting because each collision is actually described by a homographic transformation, a fractional linear transformation of both U plus and U minus with a matrix which has integral entries, you know, one minus two and things like that, and determinant minus one. And, and the full chaotic, so first you prove that the dynamics is chaotic, but it is chaotic, but it is linked to these special PSL 2Z special matrices, you know, the group that Poincaré discovered in the for function functions, okay? Now, uh, it has been proven that, um, I mean, what I described here, this billiard is an approximation to the full dynamics and there are still problem, mathematical problems. But this BKL billiard uh, has interesting statistical properties that were investigated. This is not, by the way, a, a misprint. There is Lifshitz and Lifshitz because they were two brothers, you know, and that's the only paper on which they collaborated. Uh, and also, Sinai has worked with them to establish some uh, uh, statistics of this, and then uh, Maurice Antoine. This dynamics is interesting. It is a dynamics in a plane. There is an invariant measure, which is very simple. 
So this leaves in there this. But this measure has an infinite measure. That is, if you integrate this measure on, on the Hopscotch court, okay, which are the colored regions, you find infinity. And because of this, it is not, you cannot use the usual ergodic theory uh, theorems because uh, you have something infinite. But still, it is chaotic. Now, this was introduction for the usual belinsky raetnik of lipschitz billiard Now, the real juice of the thing, but I will just touch on it, is what happens when you do the same thing in higher dimensions, okay? This was Einstein's gravity in three plus one dimension. And then the first thing you discovered is, I mean, this was discovered only in 2001, which is that the chaos is linked to a hidden symmetry because the chaos was described by a billiard in Lorentzian space. But this billiard is a chamber with walls, okay? But this chamber is very, very special. It is arithmetic, it has special properties, and actually it is what is called the vial chamber of an hyperbolic Katzbudi algebra, okay? Objects that have been introduced at the end of the 60s. And, uh, and for instance, for gravity in any dimension, you find that the billiard looks like that up to space-time dimension 10, but when you are in space-time dimension 11 or more, the thing changes because the, it becomes uh, non-chaotic instead of being chaotic. Uh, and if you study uh, the Lagrangians that represent the modified gravity described by string theory or M theory, supergravity in 11 dimension, and all those models, you find that they are chaotic and that they have a very interesting uh, billiard chamber, which is the vile chamber of this object, E10, the exceptional group uh, of Carton in the Carton classification, but going beyond E8 to the hyperbolic case, which is an object which is, uh, that many people suggested is playing a very important role in physics. So this was this thing that you have a chaotic thing, but this chaotic thing link, seems linked to something else. Now, let me now, uh, in the, uh, what, five minutes left? Yes. This is about the quantum aspect. The quantum aspect uh, can be investigated, uh, especially if you look at a special case, which is the quantum dynamics of a supersymmetric triaxially squashed three sphere. What does it mean? This means it's a homogeneous model, which is uh, you take a three sphere and you squash it in along three axes so that it becomes the ABC type sphere, okay? That it has one axis where it is squashed by A, one by B, one by C, and, but the rest is homogeneous. And then the theory you study on it is not Einstein's gravity, but it is supergravity. Supergravity is a very natural extension of uh, Einstein's theory in which uh, the metric of space-time, G mu nu, has a fermionic partner, which is uniquely defined, which is a hidden, I mean, it's not a hidden symmetry, it's a special symmetry between bosons and fermions. Anyway, it's an important theory which exists, which has fermionic partners for gravity. And from the technical point of view, the metric is described by a general quadratic form with respect to uh, the special uh, maurer carton uh, equations forms. Uh, but technically, when you, you, what are the degrees of freedom? The degrees of freedom, first there is a finite number of degrees of freedom because this is an homogeneous space. From the gravity point of view, essentially you have a quadratic uh, metric which is described by the same three factors I was talking about, ABC or beta one, beta two, beta three, the squashing parameters of the three sphere, except that because you are diagonalizing essentially a, a quadratic metric here, you have also the Euler angle. It's like when you have, you know, uh, an inertia moment, uh, a solid body. Uh, there exists a frame where the solid body is as uh, inertia axis, which are uh, eigen, eigen vectors, but you have the angles to go to this frame, and then you have the three inertia moments. It's the same thing here. You have three parameters beta and three angles. And you have the fermionic partners. And the fermionic partners, you have 12 of them, and we are going to see what you do. Because at this stage, you want, here is the action. The action for this model is here written in, uh, in Hamiltonian language. Uh, you, have, uh, you have a kinetic term for the betas, which is the same as before. It's the beta dot square. You have kinetic term for the fermions, which is of the type linear in first derivative, time derivative. And then the dynamics is contained 
uh, in the fact that in this action, you have Lagrange multiplier. This is the action. And you see that you have those parameters that have no kinetic terms. So they are Lagrange multipliers in this action. And therefore, a Lagrange multiplier imposes a constraint, something equal to 0. The constraints, are, there are four constraints, which are called supersymmetry constraints, one constraint, which is called the Hamiltonian constraints, and three, which are diffeomorphism constraints. This constraint, h equals 0, is the old Friedman equation I've written at the beginning, a dot over a square plus something. Uh, the constraint of Friedman, which did not contain two derivatives of time, but only the square of a first derivative. This is this Hamiltonian constraint, okay, in, in this language. Now you quantize the system. How do you quantize a system with bosons and fermions? Uh, the bosons are easy to quantize because you quantize them a la Schrodinger. So you say the variables beta are the variables in my wave function. And the pi's, the conjugate momenta, are partial derivative by the Schrodinger representation. Okay. The fermions, they satisfy this algebra. The quantization condition for the fermion is a quadratic condition, which is not a commutator. Like for bosons, it is an anti-commutator. You know? A, B plus B, A equals something. And, but this thing is a Clifford algebra. It's a Clifford algebra in a 12-dimensional space with four time dimensions and eight space dimensions. And as a consequence, this means that the quantum representation of my object, which is the universe, the universe with bosonic uh, shape and fermionic content, is a wave function which has 64 components. It is a spinner of this Clifford algebra. So you have to think that the quantum description of my universe is a column of 64 wave functions which satisfy couple constraints. Okay? And you can write down explicitly, so it means the wave function has 64, has 64 components. They are, at the end, you, you, you can eliminate the Euler angle. They, they do not depend on the Euler angle. So we have a function of three variables, which is the quantum representation of a function of ABC, of my billiard, but 64 components. But these 64 wave functions, they satisfy four times 64 equations, OK? It's an overdetermined system. But this overdetermined system, because the supersymmetry constraints, they look like Dirac equations. Dirac equations are partial derivative first order in derivatives. You know gamma d by d mu, d, d by d x mu. So you have these gamma matrices here that satisfy a Clifford algebra. And you have the, uh, the Friedman constraint, which is second order in derivative, which is like a Klein-Gordon equation. But you prove that these operators, they satisfy uh, uh, an algebra, that is to say, essentially the square of these operators, the anti-commutator, reproduce themselves nh. And therefore, although this is an overdetermined quantum system, there exist solutions, okay? Because there is an algebra, which is supersymmetry algebra. So, uh, and we could, recent, I mean, this problem has been investigated, in particular in Cambridge, <laughs> by uh, Death uh, and Death, Hawking, others, uh, for years. Uh, but it was not solved, okay? It's, it's a difficult problem, I'm nearly finished. And uh, so, in fact, that's the, nearly the last transparency. So, one can find the generic solution. I mean, you can control how many solutions exist I want to describe. Let me describe about the quantum fermionic thing. So, when you solve this thing, you have a wave function with 64 components. These wave functions, you can make wave packets that bounce on the billiard. And then there is a chaos not only in the motion, let's say, of the center of the wave packet, but there is also chaos in the 64 components of the spinor. And you find that there is an interesting chaotic spinorial uh, thing, which, and the most interesting of it, but I don't want to discuss it, is that this is linked to the Katz-Moody algebra behind the thing, which is what really we were interested in. My conclusions. The conclusions is, first, that the BKL, belinsky of lichfeld conjecture about the chaotic behavior of the generic solution of Einstein's equations near a cosmological singularity has been confirmed, and confirmed not only by what I presented, but a lot of work, mathematical work, has confirmed they were right, essentially, although there is not a strict theorem, and extended to higher dimensions. 
there is an interesting thing that Einstein's equations, as they are written in textbooks, they know about something special happening in 11-dimensional space-time. Because if you look at the BKL chaos with Einstein equations, it is chaotic up to 10 dimensions, and it ceases to be chaotic in 11 dimensions. So there is something mysterious in Einstein equation which knows about supergravity in 11 dimensions, in a sense. Uh, but when you describe physics with the extended models that come out of string theory, you get, again, a chaos. But you get an interesting chaos, which is linked to this hidden mathematical object, hyperbolic Katsumudi algebra, and which is also arithmetic. You know, arithmetic chaos is very special, and uh, I don't know if it happens in other aspects of gravity. Uh, and there is the fermionic chaos. And at the end, you could ask now the real, because why do we do that? It's not just for fun and mathematics. It's to try to understand what happens really at a Big Bang or a Big Crunch. And this is conjectural, but the fact that there is this hidden symmetry, as suggested in some work we did, a, a, a new scenario, holographic, about the emergence of space at the Big Bang or the emergence of space as a Big Crunch, that the physics that describe space when space disappears is something linked to this hidden symmetry, this E10 object that I did not have the time to explain. Okay, thank you. Uh, the, uh, this uh, chaotic, chaotic behavior, yes. that, that is uh, how, how many space-like and how many time-like dimensions among these ten? I, I'm always talking about one time dimension. Still only one? Oh, yes. Okay, I just want to mention. <laughs> we are speculative enough, but not for yeah, yeah. a number of times. What does the emergence mean? Uh, the contrary of emergence, it means uh, I mean, emergent means you have a state which does not contain space and then space appears. The emergence means you have uh, the, the contrary, that space <laughs> ceases to have emerged and disappears. disappears. Means disappearance. Well, why that word as well? Uh, ah, the word, you are saying it's not a good English word. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what it's good in, but anyway, there's disappearance, seems to me. Yes, what but you're as saying. we say, yeah. okay. people say emergence, so we wanted also to say emergence in the negative sense. Okay. <laughs> can, can you take uh, inflation into account in your uh, description? How? Uh, this is pure, uh, here you have pure uh, gravity and you don't have the flattened field, okay? So uh, you don't have inflation here, okay? Uh, from the physical point of view, if indeed in a complicated physical model there is a sector which generates inflation for a while, this means that what we are talking about is what happens before inflation. I mean, really near the Big Bang singularity, and then maybe you go to another model where you have the inflation occurring. I mean, the study here is to understand what really happens uh, at the Big Bang. Just a final question. Do you know if there is a, uh, some generalization of the Ringstrom theorem for Bianchi 9 in the quantum case? No, I don't think there is a generalization. In fact, for the quantum case, uh, only some numerical, uh, there are some numerical simulations in the bosonic case mm -hmm. of, of this chaos where people just showed wave packets and now they become uh, complicated. It, it's different from the usual quantum chaos where you have the Laplace equation, where you have, when you have the Schrodinger equation, mm -hmm. the usual quantum chaos is, consists in looking at the spectrum of the Laplace operator in a billiard, for instance, yeah. The billiards here are arithmetic, but they are Lorentzian uh, uh, billiards, so it's not so much the, the, the spectrum which is important here. I mean, there is, it's a Klein-Gordon type equation, so it's okay. not clear what would be what one wants to prove from, about this. But they are arithmetic, that is very okay. special, as you know, apparently. Thank you very much. The last. Uh, and uh, is it possible to generalize, for example, um, to affine Lie algebras to derive constraints for... Affine Katsumudi algebra? Uh, yeah. Here, yes. So, in fact, I jumped to the thing. So, 
it was discovered, so you know, in supergravity, Bernard Julia and, and Kramer discovered the role of E6, E7, E8. Yeah. Then Bernard Julia was the first one to conjecture that if you go one dimension lower, that is to say, if you look at solution of Einstein equation that depend only on two variables, there will be E9, an affine Katz-Moody algebra, and this has been proven. If you look at solution of Einstein's equations, uh, I mean, supergravity mm -hmm. in that case, but Einstein equation, you have an affine Katz-Moody algebra. But here, in a sense, we go down even more because mm -hmm. you depend essentially on one variable time, but you keep all the space dependent also. And this is, in that case, you jump from affine to hyperbolic, mm -hmm. which is infinitely more complicated yes. than the affine Katz-Moody. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks again.